Well, good morning, church family. It is uh, such a privilege to speak to you. I, I've com come to convince my mind that you are right there inside that camera. Uh, and though I cannot see your faces, I imagine you listening uh, with your Bibles out, with a pen and a paper, ready to receive from God. Uh, I'm very aware as a preacher that all I can ever do is reach the ear of the listener. And I depend wholly and fully on the Holy Spirit to, to take the Word of God beyond the ear into your soul. And so that's my prayer for you, that this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, you would find that God is speaking life into your soul. So let me pray, and then we'll enter into our time of uh, God's Word. Father in Heaven, we come before you grateful that we can celebrate this day. And we're so grateful for our Lord Jesus Christ and His victory over the grave and His victory over His foes, His enemies and our enemies. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that You carried our sin to the grave and that You rose victorious over it. We're thankful that we can celebrate this day every day, not just once a year, but every single day we can rejoice and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And every day we are reminded that you are the King, victorious, seated right now at the, the right hand of your Heavenly Father. And we're awaiting the day when you will return. And we look forward to that day, Lord. And I pray that this morning, as we look into your word, that you would look into our souls. Holy Spirit, we give you freedom. We ask that you would have freedom to, to look inside of us and to examine us and to uh, show us more of Christ. May we uh, exalt in our Savior this morning. May our hearts leap within us. May, may you give us even uh, vivid imaginations as we read this text to see ourselves there and to imagine what it is that they must have felt on that first morning. So, Lord Jesus, it's to you that we look, and it's to you that we pray, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, after a painful, bloody Friday, and a long, sad Saturday, we now come to a glorious Resurrection Sunday. This is the most holy weekend uh, ever. And it's something we commemorate at least once a year, but I hope more than that. But especially this time of year, we, we commemorate, we remember, we think back on, we meditate on what our Lord did on the cross and what those disciples must have experienced during that Saturday of loss. And then this day, this glorious Resurrection Sunday. And this is why the church meets on Sunday, by the way. The church has been meeting on Sundays, the first day of the week, since the beginning. Because the, the apostles wanted to commemorate, they wanted to remember, they wanted to celebrate the resurrection of their Lord and of ours. And so, church, this morning we have much to rejoice in. And I hope that uh, your heart is filled with gladness in all that this day represents. The crux of everything we believe as Christians hinges upon this weekend. As I've been thinking over the significance of the death and resurrection of our Lord over these last couple weeks, and, and specifically how to, to package it and to bring it to you, as a pastor, I haven't been doing this a long time, but, but every year you come up to this time again and, and you want to give people a, a fresh insight into... Uh, these events that we know so well and that are so important to us. And so I've been mulling over and meditating on the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord. And as I keep turning it and turning it and turning it like a diamond in my hand, every time I turn it, I see a new facet of beauty uh, as the light of God's Word reflects off of these events and, and shows us more insights. And this morning, I want to share with you something that caught my eye as I was studying God's Word, something that uh, I, I 
thought of before but never really understood like I do now. And I hope that it will encourage your heart as much as it has encouraged mine. You see, as you turn the, the events of this weekend, like I said, like that diamond, there's, there's lots of different angles that you can see it and appreciate its beauty. But one in particular stems from Genesis 3.15. You'll remember in Genesis 3.15, God is making a promise to the serpent. He's cursing the, the earth, he's cursing mankind, he's cursing the woman, he's, he's cursing the serpent. And as he curses the serpent, he says these words. This is God speaking to Satan. I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, in this curse, there is also a promise. It's a promise for us that life will come again. It's a promise for us, even in Genesis 3.15, that, that God has a plan to fix this problem, to right these wrongs that we've gotten ourselves into. But it is a promise to the serpent that there would be a future battle between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. God concedes that, that in this battle, Satan has won. Mankind has fallen. They have, they have plunged themselves into sin and into darkness and into ruin. But God is not done. And God in this text, in Genesis 3.15, gives a promise to the serpent that one day there would be another battle. In that battle, Satan would most certainly lose. That battle is what we celebrate this weekend. The fulfillment of that promises in Genesis 3.15 is our resurrection weekend. Starting with Good Friday and, and ending on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, this most holy week, this most significant week, this is the battle that God was speaking of. In, in the picture in my mind, being a, a former wrestler, the picture in my mind was of these two opponents locking up in epic battle. These two opponents being the author of life and the prince of death. And in this battle, these two foes, these two uh, rivals lock up in battle. And Satan, being the prince of death, being the lord of death, takes the first shot. And on Good Friday, we see our Lord fall to death. And then the battle goes out of sight, out of our sight anyways. The battle's not over, but the battle, at least from our vantage point, from our human vantage point, goes out of sight. And you have to imagine what the, the original disciples must have felt as they watched their Lord die and as they laid him in a grave, lifeless. But the battle was still raging. And what we find is that the, the, the bruised heel of the Savior, the bruised heel of the Messiah, was the death that he experienced on the cross. But the bruised head of the serpent was the death blow of Resurrection Sunday. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it was as if God was raising Jesus' arm in victory over Satan and over death. The battle was now over. Death is defeated. Hell is conquered. Satan is vanquished. This is the picture of our victorious Magnificent Lord, though it seemed like he had lost, he came out victorious. You see, up until that time, up until that special weekend, up until that, that moment in history when Jesus rose victorious from the grave, Satan held humanity in slavery. 
through fear of death. It says so in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, since therefore the children, that's us, humanity, share in flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You can see this all throughout the Bible, but most explicitly in the first few chapters of Genesis. Because after Genesis 3, we find in Genesis 4, Cain kills his brother Abel. Even in Genesis 2, God had made a promise to mankind. He says, do not eat of the fruit that's in the midst of the garden. In the, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Satan tricks them, they eat the, fr the fruit they're not supposed to, and they most certainly die. And that spiritual death is followed by physical death. And in Genesis 5, we, we hear that repeated refrain, and he died, and he died, and he died. And, and what it becomes like a drumbeat in our soul, and it becomes a, a fearful drumbeat, and we hear it like a clock ticking down, winding down, because we know that like a conveyor belt moving us forward, there is destruction in the end, we will die. Regardless of what the world thinks right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, the death rate is still the same. One in one humans die. What Satan had accomplished through the deceit of the woman and through uh, leading them into that rebellion against God was turning humanity into death. Giving over life to death. And from that day on, death reigned. No matter who you were, death came to you. There were only two men in the Old Testament that we know of that, that never died. Enoch, who walked with God for 365 years and then was no more because God took him. A, a special case, we don't know the details of it, but all we know is that he walked with God and then he was no more because God took him. And then Elijah, who was carried away in a chariot of fire, and, and just left in, into heaven. And that's God's prerogative to, to, to make special, uh, to make them into a special case and, and spare them from death. But on the whole, the vast majority, all except for those two, experience death. Some at older ages than others, some under unique circumstances, but, but everyone comes to that bitter end, which is death. But that all is reversed because of the resurrection, because of Christ's victory. He turns death on its head. He is the defeater of death. I've entitled the message, The Death of Death. And, and it sounds clever. I've stolen it from John Owen, an, an English Puritan. He, he had a book entitled The Death of Death and the Death of Christ because what he was pointing out, what I'm trying to, to highlight for you this morning is this, that when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose victorious over the grave, he actually put death to death. He wrestled death to the ground and he submitted it to death and he reversed the curse, so to speak, that was originally there in Genesis 3. So this morning, I, I want to spend some time, I want to look at a passage that explains the resurrection. All four Gospels uh, give us an account of the resurrection from their own unique vantage point. So I want to look this morning at Mark chapter 16. Mark 16, we're going to look at verses 1 to 8. And by God's grace, we'll just, we'll just highlight a few uh, important observations there. And then I want to end our time by drawing your attention to uh, some other important texts in the New Testament. So Mark chapter 16, I encourage you to turn there in your Bible, and let me read this text for us, 
and then, uh, then we'll move through it slowly. Mark 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, had been rolled back. It was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. As we make our way through this text, I want to just paint the scene for you. I want to, I want to walk through it slowly and, and fill in some of the gaps for our understanding, if I can before pausing to, to camp out on verse 6 in particular. And then, like I said earlier, we'll, we'll move on to, su, to some very important texts in the New Testament that draw out implications for us regarding the resurrection of our Lord. So here we go. The, the resurrection story is, is very simple. All the Gospel writers give us a very... Uh, simple version of the resurrection. They don't go into lots of details. We wish we could have books written on this, this one event so that we could have all the details, that we could have all of the scene painted for us. But we don't have that. We have essentially a paragraph of information in each of the Gospels. The Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, which started on Friday evening at sundown, ended on Saturday evening at sundown. And so that's why they had to hurriedly put Jesus in a tomb on Friday because they had to do it before the Sabbath. It was against Old, Old Testament custom to work on the Sabbath. And so Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate. He gets the permission to take the body down. They, they do a quick uh, preparation job, not a thorough job like they would have wanted to do, and they quickly put Jesus in a tomb, they roll a stone in front of it with the intention that they're going to come back after the Sabbath and finish anointing his body for burial. So when the Sabbath was passed, meaning this is now Friday evening, the sun has gone down, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome who is James and John's mother, the other James, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. You can't buy anything on the Sabbath. All the markets are closed. People are forbidden to sell things. And so the sun has gone down and, and some people are out selling things. And Saturday evening they go out and they purchase the rest of the spices that they're going to need for the job Sunday morning. So they buy the spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, that is Sunday morning, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And you can imagine this somber walk. Remember, the, the disciples don't know this part of the story yet. You, you have to put yourself back in their shoes, so to speak, and, and to experience these things as they experience them. They bought the spices. They've had a very long and probably sleepless Saturday. Uh, they, they're experiencing all kinds of shock and horror because these ladies in particular were there at the cross. They saw their Lord suffer. 
They saw the one they thought was the Messiah. They had put their hope in him. And now they watched him die. And Saturday, all they have is silence and time to think about those scenes that are running through their mind. And now it's Sunday morning. They have the spices prepared. They're, they're making their way out to the tomb. Maybe there's very little conversation or maybe there's a lot I don't know. But as they're making their way out to the tomb, very early on the first day of the week, verse 3 says, And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone? Who will roll away the stone? They're, they're, they're starting to think about some of the details of, wait, how are we going to do this? They know the stone is heavy. It's a large stone. It's been probably moved there by several men. And now it's in place. And, and they're thinking to themselves, how in the world are we going to move this stone out of the way so we can get into the tomb so we can do the job we've come to do? It's a logical question. They're just, they're just thinking through logistics like you and I would. They have a job to do and there are certain things that need to be done in order to accomplish the job. Verse 4. As they're asking this question, as they're discussing this amongst themselves, verse 4 tells us, looking up, meaning they've, they've now come within eyeshot of the tomb, and they look up and they saw that the stone had been rolled back. The other gospel writers tell us that there was a, a mighty earthquake and that angels descended and rolled the stone away. And so, obviously, they felt this earthquake. They're right there. They're within uh, walking distance from the, the tomb. And possibly, when they, when they feel the ground shake and they, they experience this violent earthquake, they look up and realize the stone has already been removed. It was very large, Mark tells us, because he wants us to know. And entering the tomb... Verse 5, they saw a young man who the other gospel writers tell us is actually an angel. This is not just some kid that hangs out near tombs. That would be weird. This is an angel from heaven sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to say the least. We, we sometimes read the Bible and we, we see people experience angels and we think that happened all the time. No, it didn't. I, I, I venture to th say it didn't happen any more than what we read about in Scripture. And so these, these moments where angels appear to people it is absolutely frightening. Every time they're startled, they're frightened, they fall on their face as though they're dead. And so they, they're probably just initially startled at the fact that there's someone there. But then I also think that they're startled at the fact that he's actually an angel. What is going on? These poor women are going on an emotional roller coaster. They're already deeply saddened at the loss of their Lord. They're, they're grieving. They're, they're in emotional upheaval. And now they're startled on top of it. No doubt they see within eye, eye shot the soldiers who were put there to guard the tomb. I believe it's Matthew who tells us that when the angels came down and the earthquake happened, the, the soldiers saw it and they were frightened. They fell on the ground as though they were dead. They were just seized with fear. But these soldiers are still there and now these women see these soldiers and, and they're panicked. What is happening? And in their alarm, the angel, verse 6, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then starting in verse 7, he gives them some instructions. But I want to highlight, I want to focus in on our time here this morning on, the, on these statements given by the angel to the women. Six statements taking each one in, in, in turn, do not be alarmed. Easy for you to say, angel, you're an angel. 
We're spooked, we're panicked, we're freaked out. What is going on? We've never seen anything like this. We've never encountered anything like this before. But the angel just says, very matter-of-factly, do not be alarmed. Don't worry. And we could say in sympathy for these women, easier said than done. But the angel just simply says, don't be alarmed. And then he says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. Very matter-of-factly. He knows why they're there. He lets them know that he knows why they're there. And, and, and I just, as I was studying this, I just couldn't help but think of myself in their shoes. And the sarcastic side of me started to come out. Uh, obviously, I'm not experiencing what they were experiencing. I'm not, I'm not seized with fear and panic. I haven't seen an angel. So I'm just seeing this from my own, I guess, sarcastic bent. And, and they know Jesus of Nazareth. They knew him well. In fact, these were some of Jesus' closest friends. They spent more time with him than any other people on the planet. They were, they were essentially part of that group of inner disciples, along with the twelve, who were constantly with Jesus. And the angel just says very matter-of-factly, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. And, and they're reminded, yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. It doesn't surprise them. They know that's exactly why we're here. Who was crucified is the third statement, the third phrase. Who was crucified? And if we slow these, these phrases down and give them time to impact us as they must have heard them, you could... This almost seems cruel to remind them of what they experienced on Friday. You see, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified. You remember the one who died a brutal death on Friday, the one who, who hung there and bled on a cross. They were well aware of the fact that Jesus was crucified. And for whatever reason, it strikes me that this angel is so just matter of fact about these, these things. They didn't doubt whether Jesus was crucified. They saw it happen with their own eyes. They saw the life go out of Jesus. And he says, he was risen, or he has risen. And then the next phrase he says is, he is not here. And again, I, I want to draw attention to this. We'll come back to the last one. He is not here. Again, just seems so basic and straightforward and, and almost like, do you really need to say that, angel? We're here. We've gone into the tomb. We've seen that he's not here. Why are you telling us he's not here? We can see that he's not here. Obviously, he is not here. Doesn't answer our deeper question, where is he? But he is not here. And then the angel gives one more statement. And, and I see this as really an inv invitation to investigate for themselves. He's not here. Look, see the place where they lay him, laid him. Look for yourselves. He's not here. Maybe in their panic, they're looking around, wondering, did he roll off? Did, did, where is he? And the angel just simply invites them, look for yourself. He's not here. Here's what I want to draw your attention to. In the middle of all of those little statements, Statements of fact, statements of certainty, statements that, that don't require faith for these women because they know these things to be true for themselves. They know he's not there. They can look, they can see, they know he's not there. They know Jesus of Nazareth. They, they, they've lived with him. They've loved him. They've been with him for years now. And they know he was crucified. They saw that with their own eyes. But one statement right in the middle 
the angel says he has risen. He has risen. You see, the angel says this statement in the same manner he makes all the other statements, just very matter of fact, very just plain and simple. Duh. But these women, for, for these women hearing all of these things, all of them, they would have been like, yeah, 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 we know that. And then they hear this one. He is risen and something, something happens in their soul. Possibly their, their grief is, is tempted to turn to joy. Could it be? Could it really be that Jesus has risen from the dead? We don't know at what point they, they firmly grasped it. Obviously later when Jesus appeared to them, it was much easier to believe. But this statement, more than all the others, required faith for the women to receive. The angel knows that the resurrection has happened. He's seen with his own eyes. He was a part of it. But the women are expected to believe that it's true. And I think there's something so important in this idea. Because if you think about the Bible, if you think about the way it's written, if you think about the history of mankind and God's dealing with his people, all throughout from beginning to end, God has this to say to us. Will you trust me? Will you believe me? Will you follow me based on what I say, not based on what you see? And here the women have, are experiencing all the emotions and have seen all the things and their eyes have, have taken in all of these events and now their ears hear this statement of faith. He has risen. You see, the Bible presents the resurrection as a historical fact. It never portrays Jesus' resurrection as, we think this is what happened. The disciples never say, we're pretty sure. I mean, it's, it most likely is true that Jesus rose from the dead. Every word it's talked about, it's taken as matter of fact. It's taken as historical Fact, No different than creation, no different than when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead or when Jesus was born or any of the other things that are recorded in the scriptures. But it requires faith. And that's where I want to camp out in these next few moments before we close. The Bible presents the resurrection as historical fact. The implications are of eternal significance. Let's just say, hypothetically, the resurrection of Jesus didn't really happen. What would Paul say to that? Well, here's what he would say, because some in the, the church at Corinth were actually making this statement that there is no resurrection from the dead. And Paul is arguing with them in 1 Corinthians 15, and in the middle of that argument, he says this, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, meaning those who previously have died in Christ, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. To boil it down, Paul says this, if we believe in a resurrection and Jesus wasn't resurrected, we're stupid. It's absolutely stupid to believe what we believe and to live the way we live if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I mean, consider Paul's life. His whole life is geared around this one event. He goes out as a witness into all these Gentile cities sacrificing all the things he could have had in life. He had a fairly good life going for him. He sacrifices all of those things, lays down all of those rights to go out and do one thing, and that is to proclaim the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead. 
And he says, you're telling me there's no resurrection? That's stupid. And I'm stupid, obviously, if I'm doing it, and there is no resurrection. And now, read the rest of the chapter. Paul is clearly saying there is a resurrection. And the reason we know it is because Jesus himself was resurrected. And the reason we can know that the resurrection is true, and because the reason we know Jesus himself was resurrected, is that he appeared to people. Several hundred people. Not just one or two delusional, you know, maniacs, but several hundred people, even at the same time. The apostles later laid down their lives for this fact. One of those apostles, being Peter, wrote to some believers in 1 Peter, and in chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we find these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What is Peter saying? Peter is saying this to those who believe. He's writing to those who believe and he says, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your salvation, church, Christian, is solely dependent on this one thing, that Jesus rose from the dead. Peter goes on, verse 4, we've, we've been born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. A perfect inheritance that cannot be made imperfect. Kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here's what I'm trying to highlight, church. Here's what I want you to see, church, is that our salvation is dependent on the resurrection. It's through the resurrection that God has actually brought about new life in our hearts. And God is guarding our salvation through our faith. By belief, we attach ourselves to the work of Christ, both what he did on the cross and what he did by rising victorious out of the grave. Both things, they're like two sides of the same coin, both things accomplish our salvation, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And our role in it is simply this, to believe, to trust, to take him at his word. The same expectation that was upon the women at the tomb when the angel said, he is risen. The same expectation that was in the garden when God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Every time God speaks to us, our sole responsibility is to believe, to trust, to take him at his word. This is amazing. This is absolutely astounding. God has done everything to accomplish salvation. He has caused us, Him acting upon us, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we lay hold of it by faith. According to the angel at the tomb, he is risen. According to the testimony of the women who discovered the empty tomb, he has risen. According to the apostles who were martyred for testifying of the risen Christ, he has risen. And according to the pages of Holy Scripture, which have been preserved through the centuries for us today, He is risen. 
So what say you? What do you say about the resurrection? As we read these things, as you read them yourself, as you see these, page, these words on page, are you tempted to say it's a neat story? It's kind of like an old fable. There's some neat lessons in it for us, I'm sure, but, but these things aren't true. Or does your heart leap out of your chest and say, this is true? Jesus really has risen from the dead. Do you believe he has risen this morning, church? I hope you do. And I hope that you who are hearing this, hear this with, word, with ears of faith, that Jesus Christ is victorious. He has conquered Satan. He has conquered death. He has conquered sin. And he has risen victorious over the grave. And he ever lives to intercede for us. He is even now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is victorious and he is reigning. And he will come again to do away with all of his foes once and for all. And to live forever with his people. This is cause of great rejoicing. Amen. All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have worked, all three members of the Trinity have worked to accomplish our salvation. Before we ever reached out to you, before we ever cried out for, for assistance, you worked on our behalf to accomplish our salvation. We thank you that you are mighty and powerful. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are victorious over the grave. And we thank you that because of that, those of us who believe do not have to face death with fear, but with a sense of great anticipation, knowing that it is just the threshold which brings us into your presence. So I pray, Lord, as the world shakes in fear, worried about death and worried about this virus, that Christians everywhere would rise up with a sense of joy and a sense of excitement in a sense of anticipation of our returning glorious, victorious Lord. May we be light shining in a dark generation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you or evil victory win there's power in the blood there's power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood There's power in the blood There's power in the blood There is power, power Wonder working power In the blood of the land There is power In the precious blood of the
Could you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's power in the blood. 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 There is power. Wonder working proud in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power.